Oh, hi, this is Jerry with I Love RV Life. We get lots and lots of questions about RV power. Today, I'm going to talk about power pedestals in the campground and the various RV adapters that you can use. Well, hi, this is Jerry, and we get tons of questions on our YouTube channel. In the comments section, uh, we get people who contact us through our ilovervlife.com website and then we get a you know we see a lot of things on Facebook as well about RV power and i understand there's quite a few people out there that are new to RV lifestyle and then those who may be a little bit more seasoned but just not really be comfortable with electricity and i understand that well let me start off here and just explain a few things about what we'll be talking about i am going to be covering the types of pedestals that are out there, exactly how they're configured. I'm also going to be sharing with you how to calculate the amount of wattage for the various devices. And I'm going to provide you with a very helpful sheet to help you calculate those power requirements. And then just show you what you can and can't do with the types of adapters that are out there. Now let me give just a brief disclaimer here. I am not going to show or describe how to wire pedestals or do any types of electrical wiring in your camper or outside your camper. I think if that needs to be done, I strongly recommend that you contact a qualified licensed electrician to do that for you. But I think my goal today is to help you understand what devices draw so much power and why that breaker keeps tripping on that 30 amp connector or wherever else that you might be connected at, you know, doing some driveway surfing or something like that. And I think you're going to find this very, very important. So I'm going to break this up into a couple different sections. So stick with me. I think you're going to find this very helpful. So we're going to go through a lot of different slides. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to be showing you is the different types of services. There are four types of services that we typically run into as RVers. 50 amp, we run into 30 amp, 20 amp, and then when we do, that, I call it driveway surfing, some people call it mooch docking, you know, you go visit a friend or you're going to stay at a relative and all you can do is find that receptacle that's on the side of the house to plug into, those are typically 15 amp circuits. And there's a lot of limitations once you get past 50 amps, and I think that you're going to find this very, very helpful. Let's start looking at these slides. So this first slide I'm going to show you is a 50 amp service pedestal. This is an example of one that you would typically find in a campground. There's some variations to that, but let me show you how uh, this service is wired. So if you look on the left hand side of your screen, you're going to see the four pronged connector. This is what we refer to as a female connector. And then you'll see that you've got a ground. But the two things that I want to be able to point out here is something called an L1 and L2. Those are often referred to as legs. The 50 amp service is very unique to this in that you actually have two 50 amp circuits, not just one, two 50 amp circuits that come into your camper. And what the camper manufacturers and your RV manufacturers do is balance the load of those two 50 amp connections that come into your camper. As an example, let's say you have two 15,000 BTU air conditioners in your camper. Most of us do in our larger campers. And in that 50 amp connection, one of those air conditioners will be on the L1 leg, one will be on the L2 leg. And then what they do is balance out the various plug-ins throughout the camper that would be on each individual leg so that not all the power is being drawn by one 50 amp circuit. So that's the reason when many of us go camping, we really don't have a lot of difficulty with the types of circuits that we plug in. Sure, you can still overload a circuit, like if you, you know, are in the kitchen and you plug in your coffee pot and then your toaster and then you know somewhere nearby it's in the winter and you've got a 1500 watt 
heater going and you turn them all on and click, you'll blow a breaker. That's, that's very, you know, that would happen at your home, uh, in your sticks and bricks home, just so like it'll happen in your camper. So that's the, really the big difference in these 50 amp circuits. So when you look at this, let's look at the total wattage. And I'm going to be explaining how to calculate wattage in more detail as we go on in this, in this discussion today. So if you've got 120 volts, that's what each L1, L2 leg, some people think that 50 amps is 240 volts. It is not. It's 120 volts on each individual leg, and each one of those are capable of 50 amps. And if you look at the total wattage that you can support on each one of those legs, it's roughly about 6,000 watts. That's a lot of power. So you've got two legs, 6,000 watts. Some people will say, oh, I've got you know, 12,000 watts of power on my 50 amp connection, kinda. It's really split on those two individual legs, not 12,000 in total that you can plug everything into. So again, I'm gonna give more detail on this as we continue to go forward. The next service that we find very common is the 30 amp circuit. The 30 amp circuit looks kind of like this in most of your pedestals. You'll find this in your older campgrounds. You'll find this a lot of times in your state campgrounds. Joan and I are getting ready to leave here in a few days and go to a state campground. All we're able to get is a 30 amp circuit. And uh, you'll find them a lot of times in your federal, you know, federal campgrounds like your Corps of Engineer parks. And that's not always true. You can sometimes find 50s and 30s in, in, in some of these places. But when you look at this, it is totally different. You only have one power feed that comes into this. We a lot of times refer to this as the hot lead. That's your power lead. So in this configuration, just to kind of show you what we have, we have a ground wire. We have a neutral wire, which completes the AC circuit. And then you'll have that 30 amp or that hot. See how much difference this is between your 50 and your 30? You only have 30 amps. And this is the this is what gets so many people in trouble is that they're you know, plugging in too many devices, they'll turn on an air conditioner, they'll turn on a blow dryer, they'll turn on a microwave all at the same time, click, the outside power pedestal trips. And as we go, as again, as we go further into this, I'm going to explain why that happens and give you some tips on how you can manage it. So this is your 30 amp configuration. So when you're looking at how many watts that you can support, again, this is a 120 volt circuit, this is a 30 amp connection, and when we look at the math here, see what's going on? 3,600 watts. That's not a lot of power coming into that camper. Properly managed, you can do a lot of things that uh, will allow you to camp and you can run a lot of devices. The only issue is you may have to run them one at a time. Here's the next thing that you may see in a campground. This is a 20 amp circuit. So if you look at this diagram here, you see the white plug, you'll see this 120 volt it almost looks like a household plug, this white plug. Many times these are 20 amp circuits. And uh, one of the things that I want to share with you is that you'll see these, I get these questions all the time, I call them cheaters. It'll have a 30 amp plug on one side, it's an adapter, and then you'll have this 20 amp plug on the other side. And a lot of people think, oh, okay, I can combine these two together and I can get 50 amps coming into my camper. Many times that's not true. Sometimes the total amount of power that you'll have coming into this pedestal will only support 30 amps total, regardless of whether you've got a 30 amp connector or a 20 amp connector. And that's very, very important to remember. So, you know, some people like us will have a residential refrigerator and you'll think, okay, we can run that residential refrigerator on that 20 amp circuit. We can, but we're not really gaining anything. We're still only have 30 amps coming into the pedestal. The issue here is if you overload that pedestal in total, you might not trip the breaker here on the pedestal, but somewhere down the road in the campground, there's a master disconnect Guess what you tripped? It's, you know when it's going to happen too, right? 11.30 at night and you're not going to be able to get somebody out until the following morning to be able to reset it. So that's very, very important. 20 amp service. You're not going to be able to run much on it. Again, it looks very similar in configuration and wiring to a 30 amp. If you'll notice this, just a different plug-in and a different amount of capacity. And when you look at how many watts you can support on this, again, 120 volts, 20 amps, 
You see here, 2,400 watts. The bottom line, you're not going to run your air conditioner on this. You're going to have to really be careful in how you manage the power on a 20 amp connection if that's all you have. Now let's take this one more step and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here but this is 15 amp service. 15 amp service and 20 amp service basically run off the same type of a plug and extension cord and uh, you'll find this you know at your parents house or your friends house or where you know a relative's house you know it's on the side of the garage the side of the home and you're going to plug in your camper when you go visit for the holidays or you're swinging by during summer vacation or something like that 15 amps is not going to get you very much power if you look here let's take off that 2400 watts that we were looking at earlier and look at this 120 volts 15 amps 1800 watts very very few things you're going to be able to run at the same time Air conditioner? No. Maybe a fan? Sure. Um, maybe a hair dryer if it's you know not one of these 1875 watt. Maybe, maybe you'll be able to run your microwave. Maybe, but you can only run these things one at a time. Again, more details as we go forward. Now this is where I don't want everybody to run and turn off the channel. I'm going to spend just a few seconds here helping you understand something called Ohm's Law. I'm going to be very quick here. This is not going to be an electronics class, but there's a couple things that we really need to understand about how to calculate power. So when we look at Ohm's Law, there's two things that I want you to be able to see here. One is how to calculate watts. We're not going to have to do that very, very often. We're going to mainly be calculating amps but if you wanted to calculate watts you'll notice why isn't it w <laughs> the watts is shown with a p and the other thing that we're going to need is the amps and amps is shown in ohm's law by i i wasn't the guy that came up with this this is uh, this has been around for a long long time i've been in electronics for longer than i'm going to admit and um, this is something that you just have to learn to grasp pretty quick so here to calculate watts, we take our volts, we take our amps. Here's a simple formula. I got 115 volts, I've got 10 amps, and here's 1,150 watts. But for something that we're going to be using on a regular basis when we're camping is going to be something called amps. How many amps can I utilize? And let's just use an example, my 30 amp circuit that I'm connected to out there. And I've got various devices that I either want to run one at a time or it would be nice if I could run multiple multiples of these devices at one time. So here's the formula that we would use to calculate amps and this is what we would use in a you know to determine how much power we can use on a 30 amp circuit. So if I had some type of a device that was using 1150 watts I would divide that by the amount of voltage that I'm getting out of my pedestal. All of them are going to be roughly the same, 115 volts, and I'm going to end up with 10 amps. Okay, now again, if you've got a monitoring circuit, your voltage might be, you know, 112, 115, 117, you know, 121. You know, but, but roughly your amps are not going to change that much even if you've got some very slight variations in your voltage depending on which campground that you go to. There's a good bit of swing in there that your appliances allow you to run with those various you know, voltages that you have out there. But the biggest issue here is I've got multiple devices in my camper and I want to know how much power I'm going to consume at any given time to keep me from tripping that breaker on and on. Okay. So here is a cheat sheet. This is the first cheat sheet that I'll supply you with. This will show you the total amount of wattage that you can utilize on the various circuits that we just described. So if I was to look at the devices that I'm using, where do I find the power rating? Well, sometimes it's right on the front of the devices that we're using. Many times if you have a hair dryer, if you look on the face of that hair dryer as this Con Air that I'm showing you here, this is one of these, you know, real super hot ones. This one's a 1875 watt. Now, I took this picture of a label inside my microwave. So if you open up your microwave door, you'll see that uh, my rated output here is 1,000.
1,500 watts to run it. But wait a minute, I have a 900 watt microwave. Why does it take that much? Well, it takes 1,500 watts of power to run the electronics in the microwave and generate 900 watts of microwave power. And that's just the way you calculate these. So you have to look at your rated input power of these devices. Okay, stick with me. So this is something that I created to save you from doing tons and tons of math. Now what I will do is if you go up to the link up top in this video, you'll see now a, a card that you can click on that will take you to today's blog and show notes. And in that blog and show notes, I've provided a link to where you can actually download this chart. And I just updated this. I've had this thing for a long time. I, I kind of carry it around when Joan and I travel. It's got a lot of great information. There's a couple things that I want to point out in this sheet that I think um, needs a little bit of additional explanation. And one of those items deals with those appliances that have a compressor. Uh, you would typically find that with a, uh, an air conditioner, um, a residential refrigerator. In our gateway, we have a residential refrigerator. You don't typically find this with the electric component of an RV refrigerator, one of those that runs on electric and runs on propane. It's a different setup. But there's something here that you'll notice. The wattage that I'm showing, let's use this 13,500 BTU air conditioner as an example. You'll notice I have two wattage components that are being shown here. One is 1,325. The other one is roughly double. It's not exact, but it's roughly double, 2,650. Well, what's that extra number? Well, when that air conditioner turns on, we refer to something called a compressor kick. And it almost takes double the amount of wattage for about two seconds to be able to kick that air conditioner off. So normally when the air conditioner is running, it'll be burning 1,350 watts of power or using 1,350 watts of power. But when, that when it turns off and then that compressor kicks back on again, boom you'll get that big kick. And that's what usually bites folks. Um, they'll have the air conditioner going and go, see, I can run my microwave, it's no problem. If you go down the list here and look, you'll see a microwave oven, we just talked about that, taking 1,500 watts. And when we look at where we get into trouble, boom, if you try to add those two together, um, you're gonna end up tripping a breaker. So let's look at a couple things here and I'll explain this in more detail. Again, 30 amp service is what we typically run into by most RVers that gives the greatest amount of trouble. They've been using a 50 amp circuit with those two legs and they've never had any problem. They go to a campground for the first time, plug in thinking they're gonna get the exact same service and they are not. They are not gonna have the same amount of power and they keep tripping the breaker and don't understand why. Here's why. You've got that 120 volts, 30 amps, 3,600 watts in total. Let's look at this basic exercise. I've got this 13,500 BTU air conditioner. We're gonna show the kick value because that's what gets us in trouble. 2,650 watts. We have that running you know, in the morning. We get ready to turn on that Keurig coffee maker and that Keurig coffee maker while it's percolating takes 1,500 watts, and the next thing you know, click, the breaker outside has blown. 4,150 watts is what it required, and that breaker will not allow you to be able to do that. So what do you do? You turn the air conditioner off, make your coffee, get ready to sit down with your coffee, turn your air conditioner back on. That's how you manage your power in something like this. So look at another example. So let's say that we're gonna make breakfast, we're gonna turn that air conditioner off or we're not gonna need it this morning. There's my coffee maker at 1,500 watts. Here's a typical toaster at 900 watts. I'm only producing 2,400 watts of consumption of my 3,600 that I have available. Staying with me, the air conditioner comes on when you're doing all this, click, you're gonna pop the breaker. So it kind of gives you a way that you can determine how you can manage your power. Again, if you take this sheet, you can determine 
what you have to do. I'll give you another example. When we have something like this going on and we've got an air conditioner running, you know, and Joan's in there drying her hair, guess what I've got to do? I've got to turn the air conditioner off. I'll, you know, I'll put her up in the bedroom. Uh, we'll get the bedroom nice and cool. And then when she gets ready to dry her hair, I turn the air conditioner off for the, you know, 10 minutes that she needs to use her dryer. And once she finishes drying her hair, we turn the air conditioner back on. Something else, if you've got a camper with two air conditioners, well, let's use my example. We've got two 15,000 BTU, and that has an almost 3,000 watt kick, almost 3,000 watt kick for both of them. There is absolutely no way I'm going to be able to run both of those air conditioners and not trip a breaker when those air, con those air conditioners come off and on, off and on. It's just not going to happen. So it kind of gives you an example of how you can use this chart. Let's take it one more step here and I'll just show you. And, you know, here's an example of, again, on the, the lowest scale that you would typically have a plug in, and that would be a 15 amp service. Again, you're mooch docking at a at a friend's house or a relative's house for a short period of time and all you've got is that one plug-in that you can that you can utilize and again you've only got a total of 1800 watts so when you look at the types of things that you can run off that that's going to be a blow dryer or a space heater or a microwave or something of smaller devices that doesn't have as much power again when you look at this chart You'll see, you know, a lot of things that you can actually combine at the same time. You know, you can do things like, you know, charge up your laptop. Uh, you can watch a TV. You could run a little space fan. There's a number of things that you can do at the same time, but those are like 20 watts of power, 100 watts of power, 200 watts of power. But these big consumers like um, curling irons, uh, uh, blow dryers, uh, refrigerators, space heaters, uh, coffee pots, toasters, microwaves. You're just not going to be able to use those things with a basic 50 amp, what I call a driveway plug-in. It's just not going to happen. Let's look at the various adapters that you can use. So I'm going to show this from a 50 amp perspective for those of us who have 50 amp, but there's some of these that you will use on a 30 amp connection as well. So this first one that we 50 amp folks have would be this 50 amp to 30 amp receptacle. Now here's the thing that's really important about this. If you remember earlier, I shared on a 50 amp circuit, you've got this L1 and L2 leg with two separate 50 amps coming in. When you use this 30 amp, you're sharing that 30 amps of service across both of those L1, L2 legs. I know that sounds confusing, but they're actually combined. So no matter whether you have 50 amps before with this 30, that's all you have um, for the whole entire camper. So again, with proper power management, it's not going to be an issue. Joan and I travel and connect a 30 amp all the time. Yeah, there's a little inconvenience in it, but you know, if you're in a pretty spot and you're enjoying your camping, Eh, it's not a big deal. Just have to remember not to turn everything on at one time when, uh, when you're connected to 30 amps. The next thing that we will see, and you, you have these for both 30 amp and 50 amp, and here I'm showing a 50 amp to 20 or 15 amp receptacle. Now, in this configuration, you only have that 20 amp. This is that plug-in, you know, that you would see at a driveway. You only have that 15 or 20, depending on what the breaker is. Again, shared across that L1 or L2 leg. Now, even though I'm not showing it here, you can buy a 30 amp adapter to a 20 or 15 amp receptacle. That basic, what I call a household style plug-in. Again, all you're going to get is 20 to 15 amps, depending on what the breaker is at that house that will allow you to connect to that 30 amp connection and that's all you'll have. Now this next device that I'll show you is a great little trick. We probably end up using, we have one of these, we probably use this once or twice a year when we camp. Sometimes we'll go to a campground. We were up in Bristol, Tennessee. We ran into this. Um, we've been in Corps of Engineer Parks. We've been in state campgrounds to where we were able to find two 30 amp connections within our pedestal, had a true two 30 amps. And, um, or 
there, there were two pedestals side by side and there was nobody on the other side of, of the other pedestal that was using that space. Mm, I've been known to borrow it for a little while so we could run an air conditioner and a few other extra air conditioner and a few other things. So, But the nice trick about this is you'll see that it has two 30 amp connections going to 150. Here's the difference. For those two 30 amps, one goes to the L1, one goes to the L2. So you have two true 30 amps coming into your camper. Very similar to the 50 amp connection, just 20 amps less per leg. This is a great device. Again, we don't have this opportunity very often to be able to utilize it. But when we go to a campground that does have dual 30s and no 50s, boy, this is a really nice thing to have. So I hope you found this video helpful. Oh my goodness, I know it's a lot of information and you might have to watch this thing once or twice and take you some notes um, to kind of help you out a little bit. I think one of the biggest things is having this cheat sheet. Um, and again, go out to ilovervlife.com. I will provide a direct link for you at the end of this video. It'll be under show notes. It'll be the blog and you can go out there and download this. I'll also provide you with that cheat sheet um, that shows you know, what the total power is for a 50, a 30, a 20, a 15. I think both of those will be very handy. You can print those out or put them on your phone and you can have those types of things to you know, be able to look at as you go out and you don't have that 50 amp connection and uh, prevent you from you know, blowing the breaker all the time. I think you'll find that very, very helpful. Hope this was informative. Look, when, I, when I'm able to be able to manage my power properly and keep Joan happy, oh, you're absolutely right, I love RV life. Mm -hmm.